Good morning. I want to welcome you to Committed to Truth. It is an honor and a privilege once again to be back in your presence. I'm excited once again, as always, to come back into the house of the Lord and just to be able to be useful in his service. And so here's the thing. We're going to pick back up this morning in our uh, mini series on the fruit of hope. Uh, last time we spoke, we talked about the, the first fruit of hope was joy. And uh, so we got another one we're going to look at today. And here's the thing about hope. I love this. Hope is such a beautiful thing, especially when it's hope in the Lord. And when it's hope in the Lord, there is always an encouragement. There is always something to look forward to. There's always a reason to smile. There's always a reason to have a, 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 a uplifted spirit in this situation when you're talking about hope in the Lord. Because it's always a hope of win. God never fails. This is a true statement. This is a truism. God never fails. And he says, I would never leave you nor forsake you. And, and I love this because see, every promise that he's ever given us, he will fulfill. And so oftentimes when you understand where true hope comes from and out of that true hope, all the fruits that come of it, because see, hope in itself is, is, is great. But because we love the Lord and because we're in the Lord and we're connected to the Lord, our hope comes with fruit. Amen. Amen. So if you have your Bibles with you this morning, we're going to flip over to Colossians today. And we're going to come from Colossians chapter one, starting at the third verse. Say amen when you have. If not, say wait on me. Colossians chapter one, starting at the third verse. Amen. Do we have it? And it reads this way. We give thanks to God, the father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have for all the saints. Because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of which you previously heard in the word of truth, the gospel. Verse 6 shares, which has come to you just in all the world also. It is constantly bearing fruit and increasing, even as it has been doing in you also since the day you heard of it and understood the grace of God in truth. Verse 7 says, just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow bond servant, who is a faithful servant of Christ on our behalf. And he also informed us of your love in the spirit. Let us pray. Mighty and loving Father, once again, Master, this is your poor, weak, and unworthy servant coming humbly before your throne of grace and mercy. Just simply say thank you, Lord. Thanking you for this day. Thanking you for another opportunity to stand and be used in your service before going to the grave. But Father God, the hour has come where your people have gathered themselves together once again to hear from on high. So Master, as your servant stands this morning, I pray for preaching power. That you fill me afresh and new with your Holy Spirit and that you would bless me to be able to rightly divide your word of truth before them. And Father God, you are our Master and our Savior and our Redeemer. And we'll be forever careful to always remember to give you all the praise, the honor, and the glory. And it's in your darling Son, Christ Jesus, mighty and holy name we ask it all. And the body of Christ says together, amen, amen. and amen. This morning's sermon title is called The Fruit of Hope, Part 2, is Love. The Fruit of Hope, Part 2, is Love. And at the top of your outline, you will find these words written, Christian Hope. And it says, Christian Hope is divinely powered by the Holy Spirit, and it produces joy, love, boldness and endurance in the life of all true believers. And so I just want to welcome you once again this morning and just simply say that God has blessed us to see another day that wasn't promised to us. How awesome. that's awesome, right? And so here's the thing. In this mini series, we are asking the question, what is the fruit of Christian hope? You see, last week we answered that the first fruit of hope is joy because in Romans 12, 12, Paul says these words, rejoice in hope. In other words, God never commands a Christian to be happy if there's nothing to look forward to. Do you get that? God never commands a Christian to do anything if there's nothing to look forward to. He never commands us to be happy or to be joyful or to rejoice in anything without there being something to look forward to. But the gospel is the good news. And there is always something to look forward to. Come on now, somebody should say something. You see, something so good that any suffering that we may, re that we may be required of us will seem light and momentary in comparison. This is what Paul says, right? You see, the command remains in force. Rejoice always. And again, I say rejoice. So have you ever heard this statement? Somebody was so heavenly minded that they were no earthly good. You see, I want to peel that apart because as I've been doing this study, this is what God has shown me in this, okay? It is not heavenly mindedness that hinders love. Okay. It is worldly mindedness that hinders love. And here's why. My question is simply this. Where is the person whose 
heart is so passionately in love with the promised glory of heaven that he or she feels like an exile and a sojourner on the earth? Where is the person who has so tasted the beauty of the age to come that the diamonds of the world looks like trinkets, right? And, and, and the entertainment of the world is empty because it has no view of eternity. Where is this person? You see... There is only one thing that satisfies the heart of those whose treasure is in heaven. One thing. And it's simply this. And it is doing the works of heaven. You see, and heaven is a place of love. See, it is not the cords of heaven that binds the hands of love. Somebody should say something. It is the love of money, the love of leisure and comfort and praise. These are the cords that binds the hands of love. Of love. And the power to cut these cords is literally Christian hope. You see, so let's just go to the scriptures real quick and see if it bears me out. What I would like to do, if you would bear with me this morning, and if the Lord's will, is give you four brief observations about love from this text. And then tie them all together in a way that will give us guidance for our lives and then illustrate the main point from some biblical examples of people whose love was the fruit of of hope. And so if you look with me to verse 4, we see the first observation about love is that it is a public fruit. Listen to what it says. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have for all the saints. So this is what it tells you right off the bat. The Colossians had a reputation. And their reputation had preceded them and it had reached as far as to where Paul was at. And that their, their faith and love, that was their reputation. They had a reputation for their faith and their love. And so therefore I conclude that their faith and love had become public. Because see, here's the deal. They had fulfilled what the words of the Lord when Jesus said these words in Matthew chapter 5 verse 16. Let your light so shine therefore before men that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. So they had fulfilled that part. How powerful, right? See, love is not merely a private and secret affair. It always involves other people so it becomes public. It is a public fruit. Because he says, by the way that you love, they'll know that what? You're my disciple. So it's a seen thing. It's a public experience. Somebody, I'm just trying to reach someone this morning and let them know that there is fruit. The fruit of hope is love. And see, it's in verses five, 4 through 5a that we see the second observation about love is that it is the fruit of hope. And this is the thing. It overflow. It is the overflow of the fountain of hope. Let me read it for you. It says, since we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have for all the saints. Verse five, a says, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. So here's the deal. The connection between verses four and five shows that hope is the cause of love. So they have love for all the saints because of the hope laid up for them in heaven. And so the word hope here in verse five refers to the content of our hope. It is to the, to the things hoped for, to the actual joys laid up for us in heaven. It does not refer to the feeling of hope in our hearts. See, this is the hope of always when. When the God fulfills this promise, when God shows up, when God delivers this. It's never a hope of if. It's always a hope of when. But if you ask how a distant future benefit causes love in the present... The answer is that the hope laid up for us in heaven. It inspires hope and confidence and freedom in the present. Do y'all get that? We love the way we love because first God so loved us and then he put that love inside of us. And then we believe every promise that he's given us, that he has went to wait prepare a place for us. And where he is, that's we shall be also because he says that in the word, right? And that's the hope that we hold on to. And he says that don't worry about the afflictions of the world for you. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. But I delivered them out of them all. He's overcome the world and he's going to deliver us out of all. So that's our hope. That's our hope, right? So that's where this love comes from when he tells you to love your enemy. See, it's hard to love your enemy if there's no hope to get there. You see it? It's always connected. This is what's so beautiful about this word of hope. It is such a powerful word and that's why the world uses it so much. But it doesn't have the power that Christ is offering. You see, it inspires the hope and confidence and freedom in the present. The link between hope, 
laid up in heaven and the active love for the saints on the earth is the experience of hope welling up in our hearts. Every time you put hope into practice, every time you look to that future um, benefit to come, it, it stirs up and it swells up inside of us. See, every time I think about walking around heaven, right? Oh, see, there used to be a song people sung about walking around heaven all day, right? So when you start thinking about all the loved ones that you've lost that knew the Lord and God's going to give you an opportunity to see them again. See, it's that future hope that when he says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. See, that's that future hope that while I'm here, I'm going to be I'm going to be heavenly, earthly good for him. I'm going to be everything he wants me to be on this earth. That when that last breath comes, see, I always I, I used to share this often that my goal is to live full and die empty. That literally means that I'm going to give everything that God has given me to give birth to. I'm going to let him use it to the fullness of his ability that in the end when y'all I'm laid out, stretched in front of the altar here, you know, it's simply an empty vessel. All that Patrick was and ever was going to be has already been left out and written on the hearts and minds of those. Maybe the setner coming to say goodbye, their final goodbyes to me. Right. But it's not a final goodbye. If you know the Lord, it's just I'll see you soon. Come on now. I'm just trying to encourage somebody this morning. You see. This is what makes this so beautiful. And it's in verses 5b to 6a that we find the the third observation is that love is a fruit of the gospel. And it says this, of which you previously heard in the word of truth, the gospel, which has come to you just as in all the world. Also, it is constantly bearing fruit and increasing even as it has been doing in you also. And so here's the beauty of it. From day, from the day you heard and understood the grace of God and truth, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing wherever it is preached, wherever it is preached. Also among the Colossians. So when Paul hears that there is faith and love flourishing among the Colossians, he sees it not only as evidence of the power of hope, but also as evidence of the power of the gospel. So here's the thing. Love is a fruit of hope and love is also a fruit of the gospel. And it is this simple and it is this and it is simple to understand because verse six B says it this way. Since the day you heard of it and understood the grace of God in truth. So here's the deal. We should keep this in mind whenever we share the gospel. It is a message of promises from God offered to people who is willing to stop hoping in the promises of the world and will start hoping in the promises of God. Somebody should say something. See, God never fails. He, he never lies either. He says, I'm not a God. I'm not a man that I would lie. This is not who he is. And so we have seen that love is a public fruit and love is a fruit of hope and love is a fruit of the gospel. And it's in verses seven and eight that we now see the fourth observation is that love is a fruit of the spirit. Listen to what it shares. Just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow bond servant, who is a faithful servant of Christ on our behalf. And he has also informed us of your love in the spirit. And so here's the deal. So for the. The love that the Colossians have for Paul and for all the saints is not a love that is natural to the human heart. It happens in the spirit. Just as it says in in, in Galatians chapter 5 verse 22, it is a fruit of the spirit. So this is why Paul thanks God in verse 3. He says this in verse 3. We give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying for you always because we have heard of your faith and love. And here's the key. If it had been an invention or a product of the Colossians, Paul would have thanked the Colossians. But since faith and love in this manner uh, is God's work, then Paul thanks God. You give credit where credit is due. So now, let's, uh, let's tie these four observations together in a way that will give a guidance for our lives. You see, if, uh, if our goal is to bear the public fruit of love and if we want to live in a way that will visibly honor God the text directs us to do three things and the first one is this it directs us to give our attention to the gospel which practically means listen to the word of God read the word of God especially the promises and the warnings of God right and then put all that into practice Don't just lock it up in your head to hold it for later to retard back to someone as knowledge. Let it be experience in your life. 
You see, verse 5 says that we learn about hope in the word of truth, the gospel. And so here's the deal. Day in and day out, we must direct the attention of our minds to the word of truth. You see, the text directs us to be also in the spirit. Verse 8 says that the love of the Colossians is a love in the spirit. So it is the spirit that makes the difference. I want you to mark this down if you ain't got it already. It is the spirit that makes the difference between whether the gospel will create hope in you or whether it leaves you cold. Many times people have gone to the word and said, I got nothing from it because it didn't bring the spirit with them. So that's the difference. Paul described it this way. The gospel came to the Thessalonians like this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 5. He says, our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power. That word, when you look up power, it means dunamis. Dunamis is where we get the word dynamite from in the English language. So it comes with some power, right? And it says with power and the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. So there was nothing left out of it. They didn't give him the the lofty pieces of it. He gave him the full counsel of it, which was the promises as well as the warnings. And the result was that they had so much hope that they rejoiced even in much affliction. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 6. It says this, and you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you received the word in much affliction with the joy of Of the Holy Spirit. And so practically, we must work to forsake all self reliance as we hear the Word of God and seek the power of the Holy Spirit, not to tell us things that are not in Scripture, but to make help us feel and understand the wonder of what is already in Scripture. That's what we want. That's where the power is. This I love this because he says, I Jesus said, I'm gonna send you a helper, one like himself. That will dwell within you. And that will bring back to remembrance the things that you've heard from me. You've learned from me. You've put in from me. Isn't that beautiful? See, I'm talking about the fruit of hope this morning. The psalmist writes it this way in Psalms 119 verse 18. Open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. And here's the other thing is that we should... Pray for ourselves the way Paul prayed for the Ephesians in Ephesians chapter one, verse 18. He says that God may enlighten the eyes of our hearts to know what is the hope to which he has called us and what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. That's a that's a word. That's a word. And let's look at this. This third thing the text directs us to do if we want to produce the fruit of love is to set our hearts On the hope laid up for us in heaven. If you look over in Colossians chapter 3 verses 1 and 2, you'll find these words. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things that are above and not on the things that are on the earth. In other words, as you read or hear the word of God and as you rely on the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit, you should consciously transfer your affections off the world and onto the hope laid up for you in heaven. Somebody should say something. You see, I believe this is what it means in Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 to 13, when it says, work out your salvation for it is God at work in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. You see, we, we need to direct, our, direct the attention of our mind day and night to the word of God's promises. And seek all humility for the help of the Holy Spirit to see the wonder of what is really there. See, one of the most powerful things, most people want to go to the Bible and read it like it's war and peace. But it's not. It's where you go to meet a friend. It's where you go to meet your Savior. It's where you go and you step into his presence. And if you're approaching it that way out of a relationship, not out of a possession. See, War and Peace is a book you can possess. The Bible is one that you can have a relationship with. And when you approach it that way, it changes how you experience the experience. You see, your affections of the world starts to fall away. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13, he says this. Set your hope fully on the grace that is coming to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And it's when you go to the word is where he starts to reveal himself. 
when you start to read and you start to study and you start to meditate and you start to pray and you start to ask God and his Holy Spirit to come in and give you understanding, give you wisdom, give you what you need to fully take away what he wants you to understand and have at this time. Because he may bring you back six years from now reading that same passage of scripture again. And because you've grown so much in him, he gives you a new perspective, another facet of that same lens. Powerful. War and peace don't do that, by the way. And this love will transfer and change everything. See, and by the grace of God, the result will be the visible fruit of love. Now, here's what I mean by that. We will be more patient, more kind. We'll be less jealous, less boastful, less arrogant, less rude. We will not just seek our own advancement, but we'll strive to do to others what we would have them do to ourselves. Somebody should say something. And we will be less irritable. And we won't be so prone to keep an account of wrongs or return evil for evil. See, this is what I'm talking about when you have this fruit of love that's visible in your heart and your life because you've lived yourself and left yourself in that word. You will be inclined to bear all things and endure all things for the sake of your neighbor. You will not speak about your neighbor's faults without first going to your neighbor yourselves. You will return, you will return good for evil. Somebody. And you will use and we will use our discretionary time to not to maximize our fleeting comforts by devising ways to be a blessing to to the lost and suffering. That's what we'll do with that extra time. Instead of binge watching Netflix. Huh? See, more and more, our whole lives will be taken on and overflowing in the spirit directed path. This is what's going to happen. And then this love will transform you and your family and the church. And as Jesus says, the world will see your good deeds and give glory to your father in heaven. This is a powerful situation because, see, there is no better evangelism in all the world than than a church whose hope in God is so strong that they gladly deny themselves in order to meet the needs of others and somebody needs to say something because that's the church we have to be because that's the church he says he's coming back for you see we've now we've made our four observations about love from the text is that it is a public fruit it is a fruit of hope and it is a fruit of the gospel and it is a fruit of the spirit and we have tied these together in a way that Give some practical guidance for our lives that we give attention to the promises of God's word, right? That we prayerfully rely on the Holy Spirit and that we set our affections on the hope laid up for us in heaven. And in the power of that hope, we walk in love, real love. That 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verses 4 through 8a love, not that ooey gooey feeling of love. But real love, the love that comes from your will and not from the object being loved. See, that's what we're talking about. So now let's get ready to close this for you real quick. I want to give you two biblical illustrations of people who have performed acts of love by the power of hope. And I pray that these illustrations will stir you to hope and love the way it did them. The first one's going to come from Hebrews chapter 10, verse 34. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 34, and it says this. For you showed sympathy to the prisoners and accepted full joyfully the seizure of your property, knowing that you have for yourselves a better possession and a lasting one. Let me set the backstory for you real quick. The situation is that some of the church members had been in prison and the rest were faced with the moral dilemma of whether to go underground and save themselves or whether to go visit the prisoners and risk losing life and possessions. That was the issue. Verse 34 shares what they did and why. It says, for you showed sympathy to the prisoners and accepted joyfully the seizure of your property, knowing that you have for yourself a better possession and a lasting one. So my question was, what was the power that drove them in love to the prisoners' doors? It was simply this, is that they knew that they had a better possession and a lasting one coming. 
It was the hope of that that drove them to love. It was that hope. Or to put it another way, it was heavenly mindedness that broke the power of worldly love of furniture, houses, and security. And it freed the saints to risk their lives in love. Powerful. See, that's the word. That's who we're supposed to be. We ain't dying like that. We ain't risking like that. Therefore, I say it again. It is not heavenly mindedness that hinders love. When religious people, notice I'm saying religious people, not Christian folks, not folks that are that followers of Christ, true believers in Christ, religious folks. When religious people fail to love, it is not because they have fallen in love with heaven, it's be, but because they ha- are still in love with the world. Because you can't tell me you're so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. Because if you're heavenly minded, because here's why heaven is a place of love. And if I'm there in my mind, in my heart, in my spirit, then therefore I'm going to live it out where I'm at. Come on now. Let's just call it what it is. But let me give you my second illustration. Many of y'all know the story of, uh, of uh, Moses when he was being raised by Pharaoh's daughter, right? My question is this. What power moved Moses to leave the comforts of Pharaoh's court and become the leader of a grumbling and stiff-necked people and to be faithful to them for 40 years of trouble? What power? Because it's in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 24, 26, you find these words. It says, by faith. Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to share ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered abuse suffered for the Christian, for Christ, excuse me, greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he looked to the reward. You see, here's an illustration of how a confident hope for a greater reward actually changes our value system. You see, Moses actually considered abuse and reproach for the cause of Christ to be greater wealth than the treasures, all the treasures of Egypt. Somebody to say something. You see, he was utterly out of step with the world around him and he had been transformed by the renewing of his mind. And you might ask the question, how? Look at verse 26. It tells you how. Because he looked to the reward. Did y'all see it? He looked to a future promise. He had set his minds on the great promises of God. And so let it be said again that it is not heavenly mindedness that binds the hands of love. On the contrary, it is the worldly desire for the, for the pleasures and, and, and treasures of Egypt. And the worldly fear of suffering that shackles the hands of love. But when a person looks away from the world to the exceedingly great rewards of God's promises, there is something awesome and something special in that. Because all... The, our li- when, when our lives with a deep confidence is lived this way in the coming glory of the children of God, the shackles of worldliness are broken and the hands of love are freed. And all that comes from the hope, the future hope of what's to come. Wow. Let us close in prayer. My mighty loving father, once again, master, I thank you for this opportunity. I pray. <laughs> With every fiber of my being, Master, that all that was shared here this morning once again was accepted in thy sight. God, I thank you for the richness of your word. I thank you for always bringing it to life and making it so simple and so revealing. God, I pray that all that has heard it today, whether online or wherever, that God, it fell on fertile, fertile soils of hearts and minds, God. And that we would become the church that you've created us to be, that you've called us to be, that we are to be in your son. And God, we just love you and we praise you. And we'll give you praise. And we ask these blessings, Father, in your darling Son, Christ Jesus' mighty and holy name. And the body of Christ says together, amen Amen. and amen. Love you guys. Have a blessed week. Take care.